Welcome everyone to the Sacramento Jewish Film Festival. We're a program of the Jewish Federation of the Sacramento Region. My name is Tevin Laxer. I'm the director of the festival. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, our community partners, our volunteers, and especially our presenting sponsor, the GIL Design Group. This event is being recorded and will be available on our website in the next few days. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the life and story of Marty Glickman, who overcame prejudice to forge a remarkable career in sports, setting the gold standard for athletes and sports broadcasters, past, present, and future. The film is currently being streamed virtually on our website. It's available from now through March 7th, so there's still plenty of time to watch the film. I'd like to present our two special guests. We have today the filmmaker, James Friedman. James Friedman, as he'll talk about, I'm sure today, um, he presented Marty Glickman's late night radio program on WNEW New York when he was still in high school. It was one of the first all sports call-in shows in the country. Friedman has been a screenwriter and a filmmaker for over 25 years, and we presented one of his films, Carl Lemley, back in 2020. Also on the panel, we have Mike Lurie, who will be the moderator today. He's retired from KCRA TV, and he has 35 years broadcasting experience, specializing in political, investigative, enterprise and sports reporting. He's also the author of a book called Baseball Between Us, 16 years, 32 ballparks, 43,000 miles, a roadmap to a winning. I visited many ballparks, but not that many. So welcome everyone and enjoy our program today. Thank, thank you, Tevin. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to start off uh, by commending James for this wonderful film. I've had a chance to see it now, watched it about a month ago, and then also uh, last night again, and it just filled me with a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm and, and awe that you, you know, he put together such a fantastic thing. Um, I mean, you look at the, the interviews that he did, they were super comprehensive. I mean, Jim Brown, Bob Costas, David Stern, Bill Bradley, Marv Alpert, Larry King, and the list goes on and on of these assembled personalities who helped, you know, define and shape a little bit um, what happened uh, in Marty Glickman's life. On a personal note, I just wanted to share that I remember distinctly very much as a kid growing up in Connecticut and listening to Marty Glickman on the radio. He broadcast, of course, the New York Giants football games. And this was in an era where if the home team didn't sell out, the NFL had a blackout on that uh, game. So you couldn't watch it on TV. So our only connection to watch the game was the radio. And I remember listening to Marty Glickman and his uh, terrific narratives and the way he would describe, you know, uh, he was TV on radio, uh, describing the action, the weather, the climate, everything around you it was fantastic. And James, I think, captured that in, in his film. Uh, it was it was terrific. Uh, I didn't know anything about his background at Syracuse University or being an Olympian or the fact that he was shut out of the 1936 Olympics. I didn't know any of that. So that was all very enlightening to hear about that. And James, I think I'd just like to begin by asking you uh, how you were able to assemble all these great people to be part of your film and what, what sparked it? What inspired this film for you? Um, first of all, thank you to the Sacramento Jewish Film Festival for having me and showing Glickman. I love when my work gets shown. Um, what sparked this was, as you mentioned, I produced his late night radio show on WNEW. And then uh, I just uh, would see him occasionally. He would call me. I went to Washington University in St. Louis and later Stanford Film School. And when I was in either of those cities and the Giants or Jets, who we also broadcast were in town, he'd say, uh, Jimmy, I need a spotter. Why don't, you, uh, why aren't you calling me? Come to the stadium. So I would spot games for him. For people who don't know what that is, uh, you stand next, sit next to the announcer and just point to the person who made the tackle on a chart. And 
That's what spotting is. But I had, well, the reason I made the film was twofold. Uh, years ago, I, when I moved out to the West Coast, someone asked me, well, what's the best job you ever had? And I said, I once produced Marty Glickman's late night radio show. And they said, who's Marty Glickman? And it never occurred to me, people, you know, <laughs> outside of the New York area didn't really know who he was. And I couldn't believe it. And then later I wrote for many years in Hollywood. And uh, when my writing partner had her second child and wanted to take a few years off, I just didn't feel like starting another screenplay or television script. So um, I was talking to my wife about what I would do. And she said, well, I heard you tell that Marty Glickman story the other day. Why, why don't you make a film on Marty Glickman? I said, sweetheart, I've never made a film in my life. I don't know how to make a, you know, that's an enormous undertaking. But anyway, I got his autobiography and I read his autobiography and I came across this story on Lou Zamperini. Now, some of you may know Lou Zamperini. Laura Hillebrand wrote a marvelous book about him. And uh, there was a film made about him that wasn't quite as good, but uh, uh, by Angelina Jolie about Louis Zamperini. And the story basically was Lou Zamperini was lost at sea. He was, he was an Olympian on the 1936 Olympic US track team with Marty Glickham, and they knew each other. And he was lost at sea during World War II and declared dead. And so Marty Glickman broadcasts at Madison Square Garden the first Louis Zamperini Memorial Mile. And he said he had tears in his eyes as he, they shot off the starting gun for the race. And a year later, Louis was found at sea and he was at Madison Square Garden to shoot off the gun to start the race at the second and final Louis Zamperini Memorial Mile. It was just an unbelievable story. So a friend of mine called me. I hadn't spoken to him in ages. So what are you up to? And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about maybe doing this film on Marty Glickman, but it's a massive undertaking. I've never made a film before. I don't know if I can even do it. I said, but but just for the hell of it, listen to this story about Lou Zamperini. So I tell him the story about Lou Zamperini and my friend said, are you sitting down? I said, yes. He said, Lou Zamperini is my next door neighbor. I said, <laughs> I'm making this film. Wow. Wow. Talk about good karma, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's amazing. There are so many great anecdotes in your um, in your documentary, um, and one of the things that was uh, interesting as we sort of pivot to, to basketball is the fact that Marty Glickman was the originator of so many terms that we know today. Top of the key, swish was a Marty Glickman inven invention. Down the lane, all those all those terms that describe the basketball action. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that, James, and how that how you came to find that out. Well, in fairness, uh, Marty was roughly the, one of the first people to do radio sports uh, basketball games. So some of this would have come to whoever was in that first or second seat doing those games. But he was so creative. He completely changed the way announcers were doing basketball. Before Marty Glickman, when you turned on the radio, you would literally hear Jones passes to Smith, pass, Smith passes to Johnson, uh, they score. You had no idea where anyone was on the court. Marty Glickman, Bob Costas talks about this in the film. Marty Glickman gave a geography to the court. So he would say, Smith dribbles up along the right sideline, throws a two-handed uh, pass uh, to the top of the key to Johnson. Johnson throws it behind his back to the corner to Smith. Smith shoots, swish. You saw the game, as Larry King said, it was television on radio, and he completely revolutionized the way people listen to this sport. And uh, even today, people who have no idea who Marty Glickman is, they know Swish. Absolutely. Absolutely, they do. He uh, uh, made that part of the vernacular, and it was great. And how were you able to assemble all those uh, basketball greats. You had Bill Bradley, you had David Stern, you know, you had, I think Oscar Robertson was in there yes. too, if I'm not mistaken. How were you able to get those people interviewed? Marty Glickman, just using his name. I was nobody to them. I had not made a film. And uh, I said, Marty Glickman and the gates opened. 
The only problem I had was I could not make this film without his main protege, Marv Albert. And I could not get through to Marv. I called TNT. I called Charlie Steiner. I called Tony Kornheiser. I called his son, Kenny. Nothing. One day, the phone rings, and the guy on the other end says, uh, hello, this is uh, Marv Albert. I said, Marv, I can't believe it's you. And he said, why can't you believe it's me? You called everyone I know. <laughs> And, and he ended up being a huge fan of the project and we became friends. And he even did my two sons basketball highlight reels for their bar mitzvah films. Wow, that's awesome. And Marv was a very integral part of the movie, uh, the documentary as well, with a lot of great insight there. Uh, no, doubt about, no doubt about it. And, and there were other you know, great names. You had Frank Gifford, you had Jerry Stiller, uh, Mike Breen um, and others. How were you able to get them involved? With Jerry Stiller, he went to, uh, he grew up idolizing Marty Glickman. What people don't realize about Marty, uh, in 1936, and even before that, he was the third fastest man in the world be behind Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. And he was, uh, in high school sports, they were like, stars were like celebrities. And they even did a thing, uh, Sprinting with Marty Glickman. It was a little uh, magazine uh, comic book thing that they did he and jerry stiller he may have also gone to syracuse jerry i don't remember and he said uh he called me he said i understand you're doing a documentary about marty glickman could i be in it you know and then some of the other i called elliot gould and he grew up also with marty and actually thought he might be a distant relative of his <laughs> and uh you know once once you get certain people once you get costas and marv albert you know, a lot of other people know, OK, this is legit and they want to be in it as well. But it was purely the love they had of this man that uh, opened the, the interview gates for me. Yeah. And the interview gates were, were large and wide. I mean, you also interviewed Dick Stockton, John Mara, the son of the Giants owner, uh, Len Berman, Kurt Gowdy, Joe Namath, Gail Sirens. I mean, Red Auerbach. <laughs> that was, some, some of those were archival and some of them uh -huh. I did interview. Some yeah, it was, it was just really great and insightful. <laughs> I, th I thought one of the most interesting stories after Marty talked about his heartache of being shut out of the 1936 Olympics because of Hitler and, and the pressure there. But then there was um, a couple of years later when he was playing football for Syracuse and he had a teammate uh, who was denied the opportunity to play against Maryland because Maryland wouldn't allow this uh, black runner to uh, participate in the games. Uh, and Marty had an opportunity to stand up and said he regretted it. I think I remember in the film saying he regretted it for the rest of his life that he didn't take a stand. Maybe it you can enlighten us about that. It was the biggest regret of his life and he felt he should not have played in that game. Uh, and, and Marty was a very uh, uh, menschy guy. He, he was very honest about things and, and very modest. I didn't even know when I worked for him as a senior in high school, that about his Olympic story. He never talked about it. I just knew him. He was the announcer for the New York football giants. And his own daughter didn't know the story. And she's in high school. And one day she's watching a documentary on Jesse Owens. And they talk about Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller, the Stoller, the two Jewish runners who never got to run in the Olympics. And let's get into that uh, in a second. But um, she waited for her dad to come home. He used to do the races at Yonkers. And she said, dad, why didn't you tell me this? And he said, come with me. And he brought her upstairs to his bedroom and in the bottom drawer of his dresser under some sweaters, he took out his Olympic uniform. She actually brought that Olympic uniform out to LA when we did the interviews. And I had chills touching it. But let, let's talk about his Olympic story because for me, you know, the greatest thing that I felt I accomplished when I when this this played on HBO through Martin Scorsese saw the film and he put it on HBO, but it, it didn't play that many Jewish film festivals, but it went to about 10. And you could see the husbands knew who Marty Glickman were and they were dragging their wives to the film. And at the end of the film, it was the wives who were coming up to me who were so touched because I did not set out to make a sports film at 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 the, the theme of this movie for me is what happens when an 18 year old boy's dreams are crushed by racism and prejudice? Do they overcome it? 
uh, or they crushed by it. And Marty Glickman overcame it in spades and wanted to make sure that never happened injustice, unfairness, if he could prevent it to anyone else again. That's why he was so uh, regretful about not standing up for Sadat Singh. So to put the Olympic story in context, the way it used to work was they would have the, um, I don't know, it may still work this way. The US Olympic track trials, they would have the 100 meter dash and the top three finishers would uh, be in the 100 meter dash in the Olympics and the remaining four finishers would constitute the relay team, the four by 100 relay. Marty Glickman, by all accounts, came in third at, behind Owens and Metcalf at the trials. It was a photo finish with Frank Wyckoff of USC and, and the Olympic coach was Dean Cromwell, who was the USC track coach. Now there were no photo finishes. They didn't have pictures in 1936. So it was an hand, uh, you know, it was a by eye. But in my film, I show, you can see that Marty Glickman won that race for third place. But Dean Cromwell, and he was announced as the third place finisher. And then Dean Cromwell met with the officials and all of a sudden, his USC guy got in the race and Marty was pushed down to the relay team. They get to the Olympics and Avery Brundage is the head of the US Olympic Committee, later the uh, AOC as well. Uh, I mean, the uh, International Olympic Committee as well. And it's just factual that he and Dean Cromwell were uh, anti-Semitic, they were members of America First, an organization that did not want us to get into the war to fight Hitler. And in fact, Avery Brundage, when the war ended, was awarded the contract with his construction business to build the German embassy in Washington, DC. The war happened and it never got built, but he was clearly in cahoots. And what I had learned was Jesse Owens and, the, and the Metcalf and the other black athletes were dominating the games and just making mincemeat of Hitler's Aryan supremacy theory. And the last thing Adolf Hitler wanted to see was two Jews on the victory stand in the four by 100. And by all accounts, we were going to win that race by 15 yards. Uh, there was no one close to the US team. It didn't make a difference which of the seven runners of the, they chose, which four, we were gonna win by 15 yards. And the day of the race, Dean Cromwell came in and he said, they just learned that the Germans are hiding world-class sprinters to upset us and are going to run. And consequently, Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman, we want you to sit this race out. And Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf are going to run with Wyckoff. And I'm um, forgetting the other runner now, I think it was also a USC runner uh, in, in the uh, relay race. Well, this was an absurd lie because you can't be a world-class runner unless you've run and set world-class times. So it was a complete lie. And we did run. Uh, Marty watched the race. He didn't get to run. And of course, we won by 15 yards and it was never in doubt. The only way we would have lost is if they dropped the baton. And Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller at the time and possibly till today are the only two healthy Olympians who were not allowed to participate in their sports. The only two Jews on the 1936 Olympic team. Two weeks after the Olympics, they held a race in England. Marty Glickman ran with Jesse Owens, Ralph Metcalf, and, and Wyckoff. Uh, Sam Stoller did not want to run. He was so uh, decimated by not being able to run. Marty ran that relay race two weeks later, and they set a world record. Wow. <laughs> and that was a great chapter in the, in the documentary as well. Uh, the um, overwhelming emotion of being shut out of those Olympics, and then he had a chance to sort of redeem himself, as you mentioned, a little later. Uh, what were some of the other um, powerful anecdotes, stories that you learned about Marty that you shared in this documentary? Well, that's a good question. One of them was he became the voice of college basketball. And then when the CCNY, the basketball scandals with Kentucky and Indiana, you know, a bunch of those schools, uh, 
And by the way, it was CCNY with the black and Jewish ball players who were blamed the most, not Kentucky, you know, not the eight offer up Kentucky teams. And college basketball on radio just basically ended. Nobody wanted any part of this because of the scandal of point shaving. And Marty knew nothing about the point shaving. He was announcing the games and it, it kind of ruined his career. Well, he resurrected his basketball career when he was able to become the first broadcaster of the NBA. But once again, anti-Semitism reared its head. I mean, unlike people like Mel Israel, who people will know as Mel Allen, the great voice of the New York Yankees, Marty refused to change his name. And the networks, and, and mostly, to be honest, to this day, they basically wanted uh, this was the era when people had to change their names, any ethnic name, you know, uh, Dino Crosetti was Dean, became Dean Martin, Joseph Levitz became Jerry Lewis, you know, they didn't want ethnic types and they certainly didn't want Jews on the network. And so it was people like Kirk Gowdy and, and Lindsey Nelson, they ended up uh, taking over from Marty and it crushed him because as you said, he created all this vernacular and far and away, was the best broadcaster of his time. And he had to, you know, he lost that job and lost. And that's why many people don't know him today because he would have kept that job into the mid sixties. And, and everyone who was following basketball and would have, would have known who Marty Glickman was nationally. Yeah. So that, that was another thing, how he dealt with anti-Semitism. And then Years later, 50 years later, they were having a 50th anniversary of Jesse Owens' success at the 36 Olympics. And Marty went, and he had not realized the anger and pain this had caused him. And as he's walking on the track for the first time in 50 years, this is a man who never cursed hardly. He's cursing, he's screaming at Dean Cromwell, at Hitler, at Avery Brundage. How could you do this? not just to me, how could you do this to any 18 year old kid? How could you take his dream away simply because he's Jewish or simply because he would have been black or whatever the issue would have been. Mm -hmm. And all this anger came out in him that he had no idea was there. James, there are so many great anecdotes and stories in the, in the documentary. And I wanna ask you, this comes from one of our participants, but are there any stories that you learned about Marty that you expressly chose to omit from the film? Not of significance, no. Um, you know, I, to me, what made him great was, I mean, there were a lot, there, there's a lot of, there's another film that ends up on the cutting room floor, but I, I put in what I wanted to. And what was interesting about Marty is he really believed sports like that. Uh, it's almost primal, like having a catch with your father and th that feeling of joy, just unadulterated joy of sport and the fact that sport for the most part is one of the purest things in in our existence as humans i mean two people run against each other who's ever faster usually wins the race and it doesn't matter if they know the cousin of somebody or they're rich or they're poor it's pure it's 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 a cause and effect not always as i explained with marty not getting the race but he it emanated out of him, the joy of sport. And he told this story that as soon as I saw it, I knew it would end the film. And it's about this Japanese runner, Suzuki. And he was in a race with Suzuki and uh, he didn't speak English. Marty didn't speak Japanese, but they were racing. And at the end of the race, Marty won the race. And I think Suzuki came in third and Suzuki looked at Marty and Marty looked at Suzuki and they shared a look of, we just competed against each other. This was wonderful. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to you. You gave your best. It was a feeling. That's all it was. Many years later, Marty was in World War II in the Pacific, and he learned that Suzuki had been killed in World War II. Now, here's Marty Glickman in the Pacific with the Japanese trying to kill him every day he's there and every other American soldier. And he's crying over the memory of this Japanese soldier because that's what, as he says, that's what sports can do. And that's something he conveyed. 
This is a man who, at the peak of his uh, career, he was doing Nick games on Friday night, Yonkers Raceway on Saturday night, the New York Giant football games on Sunday. He took time out to do the high school game of the week in New York on Saturday afternoon. He would go out to this freezing cold little high school football field. Marv Albert was his assistant. And he, like, can you imagine Joe Buck or Al Michaels doing a high school game of the week today? Yeah. And, and he would, he just wouldn't do it to show people the athletes. At halftime, he would have on members of the chess club, the glee club, the dance teams. He wanted to show the public, especially as Vietnam started to come in in the late 60s, and that a lot of adults thought kids were just protesting and were no good. He wanted to show the adults, these kids are doing wonderful things. You got to look at them too. It's just who he was. He, he, he did so much great work with the police athletically. The guy was just, uh, just, he was a prince. Yeah. And James, I can remember actually watching some of those high school football uh, game of the weeks growing up in Connecticut. They'd show them, you know, I think it was on, WPIX channel. WPIX channel. Yeah. And uh, it would be, you know, the Rye, New York, you know, so and so is against the Mamaronek, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, I didn't have any connection to those schools, but I watched because right. Ray Glickman was doing the broadcast. So yeah, yeah. that was fun. I wanted to ask you a little bit, and we'll get into some questions from the audience here in just a bit. But I wanted to ask you a question about uh, Marty's family. You interviewed Nancy Glickman, his daughter, yes. uh, is, in the, uh, is in the documentary. Uh, but what more can you share with us? Can, can you tell us about his, his other kids and a little bit about his family situation? Nancy is the one who had all the archives and gave me uh, a dozen scrapbooks and uh, uh, all these 16 millimeter, eight millimeter films. So she was the one mainly involved and she could come out to LA and, you know, uh, I was making this film extremely inexpensively, so I could not afford to the children, the other children are around the country. So I was able to go to New York and, and film all the broadcasters and everybody, but I wasn't, and I wasn't able to go to Michigan or Pennsylvania, wherever they lived, but they did come to the premiere in New York and they loved the film. And uh, that made me feel good because a lot of times you make a film and the family had other thoughts about it because they they lived some of it. But what I really covered was not that. What I covered were things they didn't even know about. So that that's what I try and do. I, I'm a research nut. And I, I find the film and researching it, <clears throat> as long as I'm on the subject, <clears throat> when you're a research nut, it's basically a scavenger hunt. And you're just constantly looking for footage. And I found a newsreel, two things. I found a newsreel of the Olympic team coming into Berlin. And the first time I saw it, it was like two in the morning, I'm up looking at all this stuff. And I go, oh my God, is that Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller on the bus? There are 500 athletes on the US Olympic team. This bus had like 12 people. I happened to catch lightning in a bottle and I was able to put Marty Glickman in Berlin in the film to establish he was there. So you go berserk. The other thing was I had a VHS tape of uh, Paramount newsreels. And at the end of this tape, there was this very snowy, you couldn't make out anyone. It looked like a race, but you couldn't even tell. And it took six months to get this transferred because ultimately this was from nitrate film, which at the time you'll see little specks on the screen of silver nitrate. This stuff blows up in the lab when you transfer it. That's why they don't use it anymore. <laughs> and I had to wait six months to find out is Marty Glickman in this race? And I finally get to see it. And not only is, in the, is he in the race, he wins the race and he's holding the trophy. And that's one of the stills I use to show the, you know, show the film. I love uh, some of the, um, some of the names that came up with, uh, you came up with in the, in the documentary that he called himself or he was called the five, eight Flatbush Flash. The Flatbush <laughs> Flash is from Flatbush Brooklyn. Right. Uh, what other little nuggets did you find, uh, James, about uh, about Marty Glickman that was maybe a surprise to the family, something they didn't know? Um, I don't think that they totally knew about just how much Marty helped so many other broadcasters. 
he was the announcer's coach at NBC for a while. But this is a man who, Charlie Steiner, who's the LA Dodger announcer, grew up around the corner from me in, in Malvern, New York. He would tell me, I get a, I'm doing US general football team games that Donald Trump owned at the time. And I get a call from Marty Glickman. I had never spoken to Marty Glickman. I don't even know how he got my number. And I thought it was a friend making a joke. And it was Marty Glickman. And he said, listen, I saw your work. Why don't you bring your tapes over and we'll go over it. So Charlie Steiner realized this was real. He goes over to Marty's place in New York City. And he, and Charlie said, I learned more in those three hours with Marty than I have learned in the entire 15 years of my career. He just loved broadcasting. And he took it very seriously. And he wanted everyone who did broadcast to be the best they could be. And he was very critical. He was not one to hold words back. And one of the things, and he, he was very terse. He wanted, you know, what's the few, how economical can I say what I need to say? What's the shortest amount of, you know, the smallest amount of words I can use to say this. And as an homage to Marty, when I wrote the narration for this film, I tried to emulate his terseness and have it be as spare as possible. Yeah, and there were many other careers that he influenced and shaped as well. Uh, you included in the film, uh, Len Berman said he was a tremendous influence for him. I think uh, Kurt Gowdy, Joe Namath uh, was very complimentary. That of, didn't uh, work as well, but yes. <laughs> Uh, and there were others. So clearly he was uh, he was inspirational for so many. And then there was a female broadcaster, um, Gail, see, Siren. Gail, Gail Sirens. Maybe yeah. you can talk about her a little bit. Um, she was the first NBC wanted to do a stunt. She was a newswoman in, I believe, Tampa, Florida. And they wanted to do a stunt at the end of the year and put a woman broadcaster on the air. And they chose Gail Searins. And then they said, listen, I think you should work with Marty Glickman before you do this. So they did it, excuse me, they did a game. And um, Marty, <coughs> how would you say? And Marty um, critiqued the thing. And, and she went on and did the game for NBC. And it got a few more uh, viewers, and which is what NBC wanted, a ratings thing. And Gail didn't want to, she was offered to do six more games, but she didn't really want to leave her family in Tampa to do it. So she stayed as a newscaster. But she said so many people in the sports industry at that time would have been so dismissive of a woman. I mean, it's only today that, that there are now women play-by-play -play announcers in football and basketball. You're just seeing it the last year or two. And she said that he was so kind to her and so gentle in, in helping her and encouraging. And it just, that's who the guy was. Even though he, he didn't mince words, he told you what you needed to hear. Because Marty's attitude was, you know, the game is the thing, not the broadcaster. The only one who turns in to hear the broadcaster is the broadcaster's mother. <laughs> Right. Well, um, in just a minute or so, uh, James, we'll, we'll open it up to the audience so they can weigh in with questions. But before we do, I just wanted to ask you one final question, which is, were there any other little um, little pieces, little anecdotes, little stories that you wanted to share uh, with the audience that we haven't spoken about, we haven't talked about so far? I'll tell you one fun thing. At the end of the movie, Marty did this commercial for Hot Wheels uh, oh, yeah. that I put in the closing credits. And uh, I found this thing. I don't know how I, and it brought back so many memories. And I get a call from this woman. And I say, I don't know who she is. And she says, I'm the sister of, and of the boy in the commercial who loses the Hot Wheels race. And it's the agony of defeat, right? And the poor kid was made fun of by his sisters and all his friends for years and years for that commercial. <laughs> and she called me up and she said, would you please give me a copy of this commercial so I can show it to my brother and uh, probably torment him again. But I mean, <laughs> just have fun with. So uh, the other thing was uh, speaking to so many people, uh, especially archivists and things like that. I don't think the family knew about the love people who the people who knew Marty Glickman, the love people had for this man. He really was, uh, it's an overused cliche now, but he really was a soundtrack of a lot of people's sports lives in, in the Northeast for a long time, long time. 
Absolutely. There, and that was really made, uh, you really felt that in the movie. It really came across uh, very, very well. And I love the, uh, the tribute, you know, uh, when he was doing his final New York Jets football game. Um, and then it closed in, the camera sort of went in on him a little bit. Uh, it was nice, very touching, touching tribute. Um, and uh, I think we have um, some people that want to ask some questions. Uh, so I'm going to kind of open it up and, and I'd like to uh, introduce my friend, my good friend, Marty Gonzalez, uh, who's here listening. Uh, Marty and I uh, grew up in the Channel 3 newsroom together for many, many years, along with uh, Larry Blitzstein and Marty. Uh, I think you have a question for James. I think I'm unmuted now. Uh, James, congratulations on, on a wonderful film. Uh, I learned so much from watching uh, Marty Glickman's story through your eyes. I really do appreciate your work. Thank you uh, I'm, just, I, I'm just wondering, how do you think Marty's life would have changed had he been allowed to participate in the 36 Olympics? Well, he said he, he was known for not participating. So he said, had I participated, you probably wouldn't know me as an athlete because who can name the, the relay race guys in the, on the Olympic team? I can't. Uh, so that's one thing he said. But uh, it would not have changed his professional career because of where the country was. The country just wasn't ready for Jewish broadcasters on national broadcasts. So that would not have changed. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it would have, uh, I don't think it would have changed the way he wanted to get back to younger people. Uh, the youth of America was a huge thing with him. And I think it came out of having his dreams crushed at that age you know, but overcoming it, finding a way to overcome it. And what's ironic is Sam Stoller, Marty said, was never quite the same after that. And he, you know, he was pulled from the relay race the day of his birthday, <clears throat> you know, on his birthday. And he was also 21, a senior at Michigan, and that would be his last race forever. And he never got to run it. Marty had the uh, possibility of running again, but World War II happened and there were no Olympics for several, for many years, actually. Um, but the fact that here's a guy who puts everything into sports, loves sports, plays everything. And he, that's what crushes him. The fact that, and, and yet he uses sports to rise up and to share his love of what it can do for people. And I'm a big sports nut, you know, coached all my boys basketball games when they were younger and yeah I, I really to this day I walk around Beverly Hills I must have coached 40 teams over the 10-year period and kids who are now grown up are coach coach you know you know it's it's it just lives on it's a sense of community almost thank you that's, that's great um anybody else uh listening today that would like to weigh in have a question for James open mic I have a question. So you've talked a little bit about the archival materials you found. Where are the sources that you go to find these obscure pieces of film? You know, in some cases you don't even remember because you go on the internet at 10 at night and at three in the morning, you must have gone through 50 different ways to get to someplace and you don't even know how it started and you find it. But I'm just, uh, it's, uh, I just am a research nut. I absolutely, I'm like a dog with a bone trying to find whatever I can. And then you call in every favor you can. And you, uh, I had a friend who knew someone at CBS. So he was able to give me some footage when Marty did a game at CBS. I, I um, Marv Albert and Bob Costas helped me when they could. And you just keep uh, asking people now, the difficult ones were the NFL and NBA footage because they uh, do not donate footage. And I couldn't afford to pay. It's like, at that time, it was $90 a second. It's probably 150 now. And I couldn't afford that. I had to do one thing for an Olympic race. I had to pay that kind of money to get a race. But you, uh, you just keep looking and you, you realize that you know, in, in, in the NFL and NBA's case, Marty was good friends with Steve Sable, Ed's father, Ed Sable, who did NFL films. So they wanted to help me because they're, they're, 
inundated with charities and, and people asking for free footage and they just don't do it. And in fact, uh, at the NBA, when I went to them, at one time I was working on a Red Arback project and the guy said, I asked, can I get some free footage? And the guy said, hey, we found out you got free footage for Quickman. We don't know how you did that, but we don't do that. <laughs> and, you know, it was David Stern at the time did it because he grew up listening to Marty Glickman and, and loved him. Um, by the way, for people who are interested, uh, you can go on Twitter uh, at Glickman the Film and also the website, GlickmanTheFilm.com has clips of the film. It has photos that are not in the film. It has articles. Um, and you can learn even more about Marty there. Anybody else from the audience have a, have a question for James? I, I, I do, James. Um, so I also love the film. I've, I've seen it. Thank you. I've seen it twice and it's, it's, I just really enjoy it. And I also saw the film about um, Lou Zamperini, Zapri I can't even speak. Um, Lou Zamperini? I, I have a question for you. So, uh, bless you. So I have a question. Um, in the film, um, it shows that Jesse Owens um, really wanted Marty to run. And, and, if, and as you say, you know, um, Marty and Sam Stoller, you know, were replaced. But my question is, uh, did Marty maintain a relationship with Jesse Owens? After Great question. <clears throat> Absolutely. And by the way, there's newsreel footage in the film of Jesse Owens on the ship going over to Germany saying, I can't, you know, I hope to bring back three gold medals. He didn't talk about a fourth gold medal because he wasn't supposed to run in the relay. And that was a time, by the way, where, you know, athletes were kind of ordered down to, you're going to run in this race. And he didn't really have the opportunity to say no as an Olympic athlete. Um, Jesse Owens later, when they went to England and, and ran in that race, they did a tour of Europe and the accommodations for the coaches and the officials were first class and the accommodations for the athletes were terrible and the food was terrible. And he left the tour. He said, I'm not going to put up with this. And they tried to really make it difficult for him. Jesse became a very good friend of Marty Glickman's. And when Marty, one of the things we haven't talked about is he started HBO Sports, Marty Glickman. He created what became HBO Sports. Um, uh, Charles Dolan, the father of James Dolan, the uh, owner of the Knicks, started HBO. And then Marty was the one who was in charge of what the programming would be. And he was, uh, I lost my train of thought for a second. What would he, uh, oh, Jesse, he got Jesse Owens to get some work as an, an, you know, a, a, a personality on HBO during those years. So he was always looking out for Jesse and they, they were very good friends. James, I know this uh, film came out, I think, in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, tell us, um, you know, what you've been working on or, or been uh, doing since that time. Well, you guys know about Carl Lemley, which you uh, showed at the Sacramento Jewish Film Festival that just aired on uh, Turner Classic Movies. It's going to air there again next uh, uh, year. For those who uh, haven't seen it or want to see it, it's on Vimeo. If you type in Carl Lemley for Vimeo, it's there. And you can also learn about that at uh, Twitter is at Carl Lemley Film. And I just started a film I'm very excited about on Charles Grodin and uh, the actor who was also uh, a social activist getting uh, many innocent women and men out of prison. Uh, and he helped reform the dr Rockefeller drug laws, which said, and the, and the felony murder rule, which the Rockefeller drug laws said, if you are caught giving a couple of joints to somebody or an ounce of cocaine or something. It was a mandatory 20 year sentence, whether you had been a first time offender or not. And the felony murder rule was even more egregious. That said, there was a, there's a boy who was still in prison in Florida. And I think his name is Ryan Holly. He lent his car to some friends. His friends then went out and committed a murder. And he, by the act of lending his car, has been in prison for most of his life. Mm. And so Charles Grodin worked to change those laws. Plus, he just was a brilliant actor, 
great talk show guest and talk show host. And uh, uh, I'm going to New York in a few weeks to interview uh, a whole bunch of people, Robert De Niro, uh, Martin Short, and Steve Martin, and, and a whole bunch of people on that. So I'm very excited about that film. Just started it. I remember uh, Charles Grodin, he was in that film back in the 70s with Sybil Shepherd. I worked on Sybil's TV show. I was a writer producer on Sybil. No and uh, yes, The Heartbreak Kid, still Heartbreak to this Kid, day, that's it. one of my favorite comedies of all time, just yeah. absolutely hysterical. What was Sybil Shepherd like? Uh, she was fine. <laughs> she was fine. It uh, is what it is. Yeah. Uh, but I had a good time working there. Anyway, I want to thank you all. And uh, this was wonderful. You asked great questions. And uh, go check out Carl Emley if you haven't seen it and the Glickman film if you haven't seen it. Uh, I think you'll enjoy them. And I'll let you know when uh, the Charles Grodin film is done in a year and a half or so. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank, you. thank you. Enjoyed your films. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I really want to thank James and Mike for being part of our panel today. It was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful discussion about Marty and the film. And I encourage people to see it. If you haven't seen it, as I said earlier, it will be streaming on our website through March 7th. And uh, the chat in the chat room, you'll see the link to our website. So please check it out. And th again, Thank you all for participating and enjoy the rest of our films. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.